Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, feel good about driving. This is AutoLine After Hours with John McElroy and Gary Vasilash, episode 338 for July 15 of 2016. Buick LaCrosse, from good to great. Watch AutoLine After Hours live at AutoLine.tv every Thursday at 3 p.m. Eastern Time. That's 12 p.m. Pacific. You can subscribe to this podcast for free by searching for AutoLine in iTunes, Stitcher, or YouTube. Mr. V. John, how are you? I'm doing great. You know, you're talking about listening to this in your car on Stitcher. Um, given the construction season, I think this would be a really good opportunity for people to download that and listen to this in their car. <laughs> how true, how true. Hey, we got to let everybody know we've got Dave Sullivan here from Auto Pacific joining us yet again. Hey, good great to be back. You. Thank you. Good to have you here. And our special guest today, Jeff Janssens, the chief uh, engineer on the, the Buick LaCrosse. It's great to be here. I mean, a, I feel like this is an excellent opportunity for us to... to have some dialogue about the car. We're really excited about it. It's, uh, we're up and running right now in Detroit Hamtramck building it, so be in the dealers shortly. So we're really excited. Cool. And you're, you're a, what, a lifer at GM? Uh, yeah, pretty much, 32 <laughs> years. And where else have you worked? You mentioned earlier before the show started, you worked on Corvette, too. I yeah, I've been, I've been all over the, com the company, pretty much. I started out in the proving grounds uh, in the test labs doing uh, chassis testing, and then I went to the proving grounds and was a development engineer. Uh, came back, was spent some time as a design engineer, then a design leader, manager, and then I was a chassis manager for the Corvette. Uh, I, when I was out at the Proving Grounds, I also worked on Corvette. So, and then I was in the high performance area with uh, Mark Royce. So that was a lot of fun. That was probably one of the most exciting jobs was in that bubble up phase, working on the CTSV and doing supercharged engines. And, and then I spent uh, about three and a half years in Germany. Rüsselsheim. Yeah, no was, that was great too. Yeah, I was uh, the chassis manager in uh, in Germany where we did the, the deltas and the epsilon. So we did a lot of work there. It was it was a lot of fun. So you're a real car guy. Yeah, absolutely. Is that's what you that's, all, that's all I ever wanted right? to do. Yeah, for sure. And you know, I can remember when I was a kid going to school. I went I went to Wayne. I'm a local kid. You know, my parents grew up in Detroit and uh, went to Wayne State. Me too. So, and. Uh, Driving up and down the, the, you know, Van Dyke and looking at the tech center was just, that was the only place I ever wanted to work. I figured, uh, if you're going to work for a car company, you might as well work for the biggest one. And uh, at the time, we had our divisions, and I, and I really wanted to work at Chevrolet, and that's where I ended up. That's where I started. So it was really, it was, it's been a great ride so far. But now you're at Buick and doing the, the, the top model. Yeah, the yeah, that's exciting. It's, um, you know, this is a tough market. So, uh, you know, get... Right now, the, the mid-lux segment is, is really tough. So um, when we looked at doing this car, we, we said from day one, this has got to be segment leader. It, it has to be the leader, or we're not going to be able to compete. Um, and, you know, we spent a lot of time working with our customers, looking at, you know, what are the attributes of the car they like, what they don't like. You know, we got we to continue in the areas where we're strong, in the, in the N&V area, the ride quality in the ride comfort, you know, we were, we were kind of like in the top area right there, but we had a ways to go on some of the other areas like lightweighting and making the car more nimble. Um, the powertrain itself, uh, we completely redesigned the powertrain from the ground up to be a start-stop engine, which is a, the first time we've done that at GM. So that, that's that's What's awful. different? How, how do you design an engine to be start-stop? Uh, from an N and V perspective, um, you you really have to understand you know what are the dynamics of starting and stopping an engine continuously when the customer is in the car and their expectations are they don't want to feel it right. Right. Um, normally, it's like this is an expectation the car could be potentially be a little rough when it starts and it stops, but. Hey, you do it once once a day, right? You start it and stop it in in your in your trip, right? But when you're sitting at a light and it's hot out and your engine stops and starts back up, you really want that to be seamless. Uh, so there's technologies that are available, like how you, you we've had cam phaser technology, but we actually park the cams in a certain area so that when it stops and it starts, it lowers the compression of the engine to make it more smoother. Um, you you have to sometimes look at adding mass back into the engine to make it uh, just to have a more critical mass of the motor so that it has better vibration characteristics. And uh, Dave Mascaro, our chief engineer, would probably for the engine would probably love to come on and give you more of the details we'll have on to the have engine. Them, yeah. yeah. 
But you know, the, the, we benchmarked the, the segment, and the, from, from a, a lot of people are in this 3.5, 3.6, 3.7 liter kind of category with this car. It's a big car, right? So you want to have a V6 engine, and we optimize the car around the powertrain. So we, we just have one powertrain in the car. It's what the customer wants. He wants a 3.6 liter multi-gear transmission. So um, so eight speed. It's an eight speed, correct. And uh, so we benchmarked the industry for, for not only fuel consumption for that, for that uh, leader set of engine, but also from a noise and vibration characteristic standpoint. And, and we are segment leading in both of those areas. Did so, you just benchmark front, other front wheel drive? No, we, it, was an in, it was an engine category. Oh, so okay. when, you, when you look at, um, it's by displacement for fuel economy. So if you look at 0.6 liters per, uh, 0.6 liters per cylinder, that's the you know where, where are we from a fuel economy level and that we're the best in segment for that size engine and then from an overall uh, segment uh, the infinity engine at 3.7 used to be the segment leader but now we've benchmarked them and we've we've beat them and from an nvh standpoint as a chief engineer how do you set out going after benchmark goals because you know damn well you're you're able to get what's on the street right now to tear apart yeah benchmark. well you have to you, you definitely have to take an attitude if you want to be segment leading that you have to leapfrog you can't come in and say oh i'm going to be a little bit better than who's out there now you you have to say I, i'm just going to kill everybody i'm going to be so far ahead of everybody else that they won't be able to iterate and catch up and you don't know what they're doing right you you, you got some insight and you say oh they just redesigned their car so the next gen will probably be a mid-cycle where we're doing a whole new architecture a whole new vehicle so it and a lot of it is the most important thing in my mind is just knowing your customer talking to your customer you know getting we get a lot of field data from our customers we send every single customer a survey um, and, we, and we filter through that. What do they like? What do they don't like? And we had a lot of concerns around visibility. Um, so we, we really paid attention to that. We slimmed the A-pillars way down. We lowered the cowl. We made sure we didn't have obtrusive, you know, rear head restraints so that there was good visibility. Simple things like taking the mirrors off the A-pillars and then dropping them on the doors so they could be out further to give the, the customer a better field of view. That also helped uh, substantially around wind noise. So mm -hmm. that's directionally the right thing to do. And then you understand, okay, those are the problem, the things they didn't like. Uh, what are the things they really liked? Okay, they, they liked our seat comfort, they liked our, the quietness, the Buick Library quiet. Um, so then we, we take those to the next level too to make sure, because people are gonna benchmark us, right? And if we set on our laurels and say, oh, we're already, we're already the best, we don't need to improve that, um, then you're gonna fall behind. And that's how you kind of stay, if you say you wanna be segment leading, you gotta, you gotta lift the whole car up. So let me you, ask you about the, the, the noise. Okay, you're talking about the engine noise. And right. someone might say, well, gee whiz, all they, can do, all they need to do is make a really thick firewall with a lot of, a lot of padding in there and put a lot of <laughs> padding under the hood and voila, quiet. But that will also add mass, right? Okay. So, so that was another thing you guys yeah. addressed? Well, when you want to manage noise, the, the best way to manage noise is to kill it at the source. So it, 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 the, I, would, I always kind of use acoustic characteristics says that's a band-aid right if you can kill the noise at the source if you can develop a tire with your tire manufacturers that doesn't allow the the gravelly road noise feel sound to come into the car and if you can design your suspensions with bushings with the proper isolation and the and the proper the proper damping in those bushings so that noise doesn't get through um, like example, a good example of that is our five link rear suspension uh, we had a four link in the car before and an h arm on the up level all-wheel drives we went across the board with the five link. Well, why did we choose the five link? The five link gave us the best opportunity to manage the loads. It gave us more bushings. It gave the development engineers more opportunities to tune each of the links for its, its own characteristic. And it allowed us to, to not transfer that noise into the vehicle. So it gave us better, better handling characteristics, better ride characteristics, and it enhanced our ability to suppress the noise at the road and not let it come into the body. So. There's decisions you can make when you architect a car that will help you not have to put, you know, 50 mm -hmm. pounds worth of absorber in the car <laughs> to stop it or, or to give it that library quiet sound. What's mm -hmm. the, um, you, were, you were talking about how when you were in Germany, you had worked on Epsilon back then. Yeah. What, can you talk about some of the changes that have happened um, from Epsilon from back, like, there when you know we I think our first one I here the, was like G6 yeah or something I, that I we think had. the biggest the biggest change is is that we're not trying to be have one car be be everything to everybody um, so you know we were really caught up in that time frame about having having architectures where where it didn't matter to the customer you know they didn't see it they didn't feel it it didn't give an appearance look 
that we can share those components. And when you try to do diesel engines in, in Germany and four-cylinder engines in Malibus and V6 engines in La Crosse's, you make compromises in just the overall architecture of the car, where now we've taken a, a different stance on that, and it's, we have a lightweight front end that's only four cylinders only, and we have a, a, a bigger, stronger front end of the vehicle for, for diesels and V6s. So we've, kind of, we've learned and we've grown around the architecture. Um, we've also implemented some, some great technology around um, CAE and what we do to optimize the body structure. Um, well, that's one of the most compelling stories about the car is the fact we took 300 pounds out of this car. That's amazing. That, that, that's, that's really telling. And you it, didn't go aluminum intensive or anything no, and like it, No, it's all standard steel. Um, but we have a, this optimization program where we can, we can look at 200 different variables, like different pieces of the car, you know, how thick they are, how thin they are. And then we can put 150 uh, parameters on the, the overall structure, like crash parameters, stiffness parameters, uh, Density parameters, size, shape parameters, and we have we had over um, three million CPU hours on a Cray computer that we that we paid. We don't own it, so it's 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 quite an expensive proposition, but it, it pays off because you take three hundred pounds out of a car. That's the equivalent of a of a Kenmore refrigerator. That is that is a lot of mass. That's saying a lot. So, yeah, a Kenmore so, refrigerator. Yeah, so you can imagine, like, okay, I, I you put a, pe a Kenmore refrigerator in a pickup truck, not a passenger car, but you know that when you're driving down the road, you your brake performance it's it's a little longer in the brake performance. Your accelerating off the line isn't as good. Your cornering isn't as good. So you take 300 pounds out of a vehicle, you, you really... Where did that go? Where, what came out? Is it well, we had 150 pounds out of the body structure. And, and I always say there's two things in the, in the car that are, are definitely team sports. Okay, It's a team sport for mass reduction. Everybody has to come to the table with ideas. And what we did early on is we didn't handcuff any of the engineers with saying, okay, here's your cost criteria. You have to come at this cost. We said, hey, we're going to be segment leading. You guys need to go out and tell me, what can you do for me to be segment leading in performance and in V and quiet and comfort and safety? Okay, those are the key areas that we wanted to be segment leading in. So the teams went out and they came back. And like, for example, the, the, door, the door lift mechanism for the the window system. There's a, there's a system out there, it's cable drive, it's super light, but it's expensive. It's not, it's not the cheapest uh, method to do it, but we chose that because it lightweighted the car. So, and uh, the, dis like the, the sound absorbing equipment, uh, material we use in the car, there's, there's jute with heavy barriers on it, and that's kind of a barrier technology. Well, there's a lot more expensive technology that absorbs the sound, and it's, a, it's significantly lighter, but it comes at a significant cost. Well, we chose that because we really wanted to optimize the car around that vehicle performance side of it, and it performed better. So it was a, it was a win-win, you know. And so we did a lot, a lot of, uh, you know, we've added some cost into the car in order to make it be segment leading because it, it, it doesn't come free. I mean, it's physics, so. Well, and the car is bigger than the outgoing car, so so it's. I mean, it's it's a little bigger, but, but, I mean, but uh, overall, yeah, something right. Yeah. I mean, it's so. Yeah, to come so in three hundred pounds lighter and be a half a, you know a half inch longer and wider. Yeah, and the track is. I think a lot of the significance of the car too is the way it was just architectured. We moved the wheels out, you know, so that the wheelbase got longer, which helps for entry egress. Um, you know, a lot of a lot of our customers, the people that buy these 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 cars are are you know they're older people, so it's a little easier to get in and out of when it, you can. Get Get your feet in and out of it. So that was a real important feature for us. The back seats, the 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 back seats significantly improved from an entry egress perspective, and so is the front seat. You as had well. mentioned though that you were trying not to design a car for everybody, right? Um, well, what about the Chinese market um, in this car? Well, that the Chinese market, you know, Buick's Buick's a big deal for us yeah. in China, right? We we sell about three times more uh, Lacrosses in, in China than we do in North America. So that there was significant uh, issues and things that they had with the car, but those those read across. I mean, there's not being able to get in and out of a back seat isn't a China issue, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, we we had to pay attention to that, and that's one of their their wants and needs for the China market. But that rolls into the North America market as well. It wasn't a it, the the good thing about the car is when you when you're doing a, a, a mid lux kind of car. There is no trade-off that you're making that you'd say, oh, we need to do this in China, and that's going to hurt the North American market, or the North American customer wants this, and that's going to hurt the China cost. Everything we did improved it for both markets. In, in fact, uh, we got a, a call coming in uh, that, that's uh, all about China right now. Mm -hmm. Carmen, why don't we bring in that first phone call? 
Uh, this is Clem Zorowski at Delmont, Pennsylvania. My question is, I have heard that Buick sells more cars in China than it does in the United States. Is this true? And if so, why? Well, you already answered Thank you that. Very much. Bye. Well, that's just the Buick. That's just the LaCrosse. Now, I, I, I'm not a representative for Buick. I can tell you that is a true statement. We do sell more Buicks in China than we do in North America. And I think it's uh, brand equity is one of the main reasons. Is when we came in with our, our first alliance with our Chinese partners was the Buick brand, okay? So it, it's like we, we didn't bring in Chevy, we didn't bring in Cadillac. The first thing we brought in to the China market was Buick. So it's just name recognition. You know, people in China, they know General Motors, they know it's a good company, they know it's a, it's a fair, honest company. You know, there's a, so there's a, that's, a, that's a lot of equity in China. The, the, it's, a, it's a big issue with them. They, they want to know that they're buying from somebody that's fair and equitable and, and safety for sure. You know, so I, I think that's the main reason that Buick is so strong in China is that's what we brought there first. Dave, Dave mentioned this is a front drive car, but I see that it also has Buick's first twin clutch all-wheel drive system. What is that and how does it work? Um, the twin clutch all-wheel drive system, what it, what it allows us to do is that there's two wet clutches in the, in the all-wheel drive system. And it allows us to put pressure on either side of the either side of the drive wheel. Um, and the main thing it does for you is it, it's just the it's the plushness and the smoothness of transitions. Okay, if I if I took the current all-wheel drive system and I and I ran it again in a bunch of performance tests with the one we have today, um, on a typical just wet traction kind of thing, there, there wouldn't be that significant a difference. But what would you would notice right away is how smooth it happens. You don't even realize that you're in all-wheel drive. You don't get this jerkiness where the brakes are applying. We're actually applying the torque now with clutches in the all-wheel drive unit versus trying to brake, brake one wheel when it starts to, uh, to, uh, to slip. And from an engineering perspective, some pe you know, this, is a, this is a tough one because it, it gets pretty technical. But if you do control theory, um, there's feedback control where you, you get a slip and then you control it, but there's also like feed forward technology where you start looking at what's the driver doing, how's the steering wheel angle, what's his foot, what, what's the accelerator paddle at, what's he trying to do, and then you're, now, now you're feeding forward and you start adjusting the rear wheels before something actually happens. And this will also, this is, has a significant effect on dry traction which is, again, is, is pretty difficult to, to get data and say this car's better than this car, but we'll, out, we'll outperform the old unit by far on dry traction. So the car, if you're on a, a real spirited road, it, the car definitely will handle that better for you with the new all-wheel drive twin clutch. If you're, if you're a motorcycle driver, you, you understand like a difference between a car clutch and a motorcycle clutch. It's a wet clutch, so you can slip it a lot more. It's a, it just transitions a lot more smoothly. You don't get shutter, you know, so there's a lot of advantage of the twin clutch technology. We've got a question here from Wright Knight who wrote in to ask, could there be an all-wheel drive 400 horsepower GS model of the lacrosse. <laughs> well, right now, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, we, we don't like to talk about what we're doing in the future, what our future plans are, but right now, no, we have a 3.6 liter. Okay, you got the three. Didn't you have a, a two and a half liter, 2.4 liter we turbo did. We, in the old car? No, we didn't have a turbo. It was a two liter, 2.5 liter. It was a oh, bass e -assist. system. E assist. E assist, yeah. But so. you, you're saying now your customers no. just want one engine. Right. With it, where the economy was and the fuel prices and stuff, and we were just looking at, the, you know, this is. If you can focus your team to do one thing and do one thing great, you're going to be better off than trying to do multiple engines and just, you know, spreading your resources. And then you're balancing everything. And, you know, our theory was we, we really wanted to focus on being segment leading and understanding our customer. And we didn't really sell very many e-assists anyway, to be honest with you. And, and the, this market's shrinking, right? So the volume, of, the volume of sales are going down. So you say, okay, from an overall corporate average fuel economy perspective, if you're only selling 10% of those, it's not really going to the bottom line. And it's a, and there's not that many customers that, you know, that really want it. So it, it was, I think it was a good decision to, to, to move away from it for this, the first year and get this one out and get it and get it right. So, um, but you know, that one of the other attributes about the car that I'm, I'm really proud of is that, um, you know, we're looking at our customers and trying to understand our customers. There, this segment, there's a, there's a, pretty diverse group of people, right? You got people that just want to get in their car, they want to ride their, in their car, they want to be comfortable, 
and they want to go to, from point A to point B in just as quiet and as comfortable as an environment as they can have, right? Then you have people who say, yeah, I, I want that, but I also want to be able to be a spirited driver. I like to drive the back twisty roads. I like the experience of, you know, handling and, and all of that. So the car was specifically designed to kind of be a dichotomy of two customers. Um, we have an 18-inch tire and wheel package that comes with passive shock absorbers with the five-link rear suspension, but a McPherson front, uh, front suspension. And then we also have a 20-inch wheel package that comes with um, CDC, which is our computer control technology around our shock absorbers with a hyperstrut front suspension. And it really, the 20-inch wheel really changes the dynamics of the car. It really becomes a driver's car. Um, How's it ride? Because generally, it, when you go, it still rides really well. But it do, you do you do degrade the ride. There's no question about it. And then no, there's a distinct difference in the, the noise quality of the car as well. Um, but with that said, you know, I told you before we were segment leading in in ride comfort and ride quality and, and noise. The new car with the 20 inch tires is still better than what the old car was. So we've we've lifted that whole load floor up from a noise level perspective. But there's no there's no doubt about it. If you know if you if you have you know 100 millimeters of rubber between the wheel and the and the and the and the, and the ground, right? You're going to get a lot better ride quality, noise transmissibility when you go down to a 20 and you have you know 50 millimeters. It's there's a big difference. So so the, I mean the car is very very stylish and sporty at the same time. Right. So it sounds like that's what you're trying to. Uh, accommodate in terms of engineering the vehicle as yeah, well. Yeah, from my side, you know, we always joke around. I always, I, when I'm in Design Center, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty vocal with them when we're, when we're doing stuff, but I, um, I always say I don't do pretty. You know, I don't do pretty. That's not what my forte is. I'm, I'm an executioner around the technologies and making sure they interface well. But I will say Brian Nesbitt and the team at Buick did an absolutely fantastic job with the car. Um, it's beautiful. It's absolutely gorgeous. And, and the thing is that... Um, I, I like to tell this story about my barber. Uh, he's, an, he's, a, he's a street rider kind of guy, and unfortunately, uh, he started cutting my hair when I was 13, and, and two years ago he passed away, but he, he would always tell me, you know you got a good car when it transcends age, okay? When you, when you can do a car that you can sit on a park bench and you have a 10-year-old, a 40-year-old, and a 70-year-old, and a car goes by, and they all go, wow, that's a beautiful car. <laughs> and I think that's what we have with this car. I think it transcends ages. And I know that because, you know, they're out in the public now, and we got our families in the car, and, and you're getting the 13-year-old, 15-year-olds are saying, wow, this is a really beautiful car. This is a great-looking car. And um, I would say that the other thing I like to say is that, you know, the exterior styling of the car will sell the car, okay? That, that'll get the people in the showroom to get, come and look at the car. The interior is what they buy, because that's what they live in, right? So what we did in the interior with the um, electronic transmission shift, the, the ETRS, giving us a joystick now in the car that yeah, has a, a really, of it yeah, up on the screen. yeah, on the right-hand side there. It just, it's basically a spring-loaded joystick, just like you have with your computer. That's how you shift the car. Um, it, it, it enabled us to really package the center of the car low, and in the perfect ergonomic condition because it's it's about a 150 millimeter cube that that controls that versus you know um, tip, a typical Lincoln shifter is quite a bit bigger. Mm -hmm. So there's storage underneath it now. You can see this the, the panel on the side. You can put a, an iPad in there. A woman could put a small purse in there. Um, so and then the, just the overall everything that the driver and passengers touch is soft now. So it's all a soft material. It's premium material. We put a lot of money into the interior of the car to enhance the overall feel and appearance of the car. Okay, hey, we, well, hold up. We got to get into more details on this, but before we do that, we got to take a quick commercial break. Okay. And right now, we're going to give a shout out to our friends from Borg Warner. Okay, a uh, quick question here from George from Sunnyvale wants to know, have you improved the trunk space compared to the previous model? And please talk about other improvements compared to the previous generation LaCrosse. Uh, he'll be very happy with the trunk in this car. That was one of our biggest complaints. The overall volume of the old trunk was, was pretty significant, but the way the car was designed, we had a very small opening, right? So it was hard to get stuff in. A lot of the volume was tucked in the corners where it wasn't really usable. Um, so our goal from day one, and this was a big customer feedback, was the trunk was too small. 
Um, we architected the car to carry four golf bags, and I'm a big golfer, and I've done it many times already. Um, you do have to, you know, be honest with the way the drivers are nowadays. You got to pull the drivers out on a couple of the bags and, and lay them loose. But four full-size golf bags will fit in the car. So the trunk space is greatly improved. Um, you know, some of the things the customers wanted us to improve on again was the number one thing was the visibility. The A pillars lowering the cowl and the cars from a front view perspective is is just amazing. It's a pleasure to drive. They wanted more storage space, so we we added a lot of little little areas to put coins, and we have a, a phone charger now. So it's uh, if, if you opt for a, um, a wireless charging system, um, just the overall. The other thing we wanted to do was we only have one interior in the car, so there's no up level, low level cluster. It's all the the up the up level cluster now. So it's got the eight inch display and the fully functional uh, HMI between the two. Uh, so one one interior, so you walk in the car, and it doesn't matter what level of interior, what level of the vehicle you buy, you get a, you get an outstanding interior. Uh, again, like where we were leading, seat comfort, but we improved that. Um, that was another big thing. I think the appearance of the seats overall look look great. I don't know if we have a picture of it or not, but uh, that's another thing I think was a big win. Alan Nickel was the lead lead interior guy, and he did a really good job. Um, giving us a, just a spectacular. Here we go. Here's a picture of the seats. Yeah, so you can see the sculpting of the seats and just the overall appearance. Um, so, yeah. Now, the, now, some of us of a certain age have a certain image of what a Buick is. Or was. Or was. <laughs> or was, I think, is the most important term there, yeah. <laughs> so so when, you were, when you were working on this car, I mean, did you, did you sort of have that in the back of your mind that you really wanted to, to push the, the, the uh, nature of this car forward? Without being too avant-garde. Yeah, I, but, but I think you also need to respect who your customer is, right? So it, it's, it's a, we have a lot of loyal Buick customers, right? So it's a balancing act. You don't want to go radical and, and then lose, lose your sure. base, right? So it's a, it's a balancing act. Some of it is like, um, just if you want to say, like, is a Buick customer maybe a little older than, than what than the Chevrolet customer is. It's, it's, it's not really, when you look at the data, mm -hmm. it's a misconception. Especially not a, in China. That's a, well, that's, yeah, and that's a misconception, too. I mean, you look at the average age of, you know, who's buying a Chevrolet Malibu and who's buying a Buick LaCrosse. There's, there's not that much difference, right? Mm -hmm. It's just, it, it's like when, where you are in your life, right? What, what makes you want to buy a sedan versus buying an SUV? And so that, that kind of drives you to a certain age set. And the, and the passenger car community is, it's kind of there. So what did we do to say, oh, you want to, You obviously want to try to get as young a buyer as you can, right? Because it just opens up the, the, the threshold. So having ETRS, we put paddle shifters on the steering wheel for the sport for sport mode, um, you know, and then the, just the overall electronics. You got Apple CarPlay, Android Auto. So a lot of the a lot of the techie stuff is in the car now, mm -hmm. and of course we you can't you really have to be conscious of USB ports and how many you have and where they have them and making sure they're in the back seat and easy access into the console because that that's everything. And that they're charging ports too. Right. In my exactly. book, at least. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm amazed at some of our competitors actually when I when I get in like a rental I have to unfortunately I have to travel a lot for work. And I'll, and I'll get and I always try to rent a competitor, right? Because I can I can drive our product all day long. So, <laughs> and I'm like, you got to be kidding me, really? There's not a USB port in this thing. It's like, so, but those are the things you got to stay focused on. Is a does the back seat? Uh, you know, I know the back seat's really important in China. Does the back seat change at all for the Chinese market? Like, do they get, you know, uh, their up level car has a, a sloping back seat, so okay. you, it's a, it has a power reclining back seat, you know, so. rear seat entertainment or anything like that? No, no. Oh. no. So they go on sale soon, right? Right, very soon. Yeah, and and we're really proud. You know, we're part of the rebirth of Detroit. It's 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 uh, it's the Buick LaCrosse has allowed Detroit Hamtramck to go to a second shift. So we've employed a lot of people. I'm really proud of that. Wow, Gary, how many cars are they making there now? They have, there's a lot of cars coming through yeah. that plant. And uh, Gary West and his team at and at DHAM have have their hands full. But the, you know, they're doing a great job. Quality's number one with Gary and his team. So it's uh, it's it's good. I mean, they, they got the right attitude to build the car, so we're, we're really happy with what's coming out of there right now. So, Well, I can't wait to drive it myself. I'm sure you guys are, feel the same way, but Jeff, thanks so much for coming over uh, and telling us I about mean, this yeah, car. It's, it's, a, it's, uh, it's a pleasure. You, you work on stuff in secrecy. You're, you know, you got the, the cone of silence over your head for 
three years, so it's kind of <laughs> nice to, uh -huh. to get out yeah. and be able to share it with I mean, you guys. You know, we, we've seen pictures, yeah. we've seen the price and that sort yeah. of thing, but I, you know, you know, the proof is yeah. in the pudding and that's yeah. in driving it. Yeah, it's amazing. It's a great car. And like I said, it's, it was designed to be segment leading and it definitely will be. How many so. people did you have working on this whole program? Oh, God, that's a tough question. You know, it's... Uh, it's so layered, you know. Yeah. It's it's it. I, I can't put my finger on that, but it's in the thousands. I mean, it's it's not it's not in the hundreds. It's in the thousands. Wow. So, mm -hmm. you know, you you look at global GM powertrain and it just every layer that it sets down. You know, the the body manufacturing team and the and the just the assembly plant and you know we had a lot of input from the assembly plant early on. So it's a big team. Well, so. to your point, to, as you started out, it's all new from the right, ground up. Right, and the, and the thing about the team is that, like, I'm a very passionate person, I'm, and I'm not easy to work for. I'm, I mean, I know that up front. I'm very demanding, and the team is, I have an unbelievable team working with us. It's just, they come to work every day, and they have the same passion I do, and, you know, it's like we, we, have, our, we have our issues, and we, we, you know, we have our opportunities to build relationships, you know, and all that, because... Uh, you know, when you got a team that's really focused, and, and I was telling you earlier today, you know, you want to go from good to great, and that's what I think we did. You you have to be willing to pay the price, okay? Because going from good to great doesn't mean that you go home at five o'clock. It's, hey, I gotta, I gotta, you know, I need to stay here. This needs to be right, okay? And I'm gonna do whatever I have to do to make it sure it's right. And that's the, you know, you look at, at from just the interior, exterior, the purchasing team, the material team, the manufacturing team, everyone is committed to making sure that we're, we're we went from good to great, and we're going to be we're going to be the segment leader. So I'm I'm very proud of the team, very proud of the team. Very good. Thanks again for stopping right. by. It's thank been you. a real pleasure Anytime. having you here. I can't wait to get in your car and drive it. So so all right, perfect. Thank you. Thanks thank again. You. Thank Thanks. you guys. And we're going to take another quick break right here right now and give a great shout out to our friends at Bridgestone. Well, we're back, and this is the part of the show where we have to bring in Dr. Data. Okay, so I know we're going to talk about this subject a lot for the rest of the show, and this, this, is, this is going to be an easy one for you guys to guess what this number might mean, okay? Okay. So, so mm. Carmen, please bring up the first uh, image. All right, so here we have three dates, three numbers, 16.5 million, 17.1 million, and 31.8 million, so that's for 2015, 2016. Those, those have dollar signs. In they front have of dollar them. signs. Those are, those are dollars, but what's, what's key is to look at the image, what's behind there. Oh. Okay. Ah, locks. Locks. Okay. So this has got to be, do it, do it, can I guess right now? You can guess right now. The money being spent on cybersecurity. Perfect. Carmen, bring up the next slide. So, <laughs> so here we go. So this is the global automotive security market by size growth estimated by Markets and Markets and Markets and Markets is a outfit in India, and they claim to be one of the number two consulting firms that's looking at this stuff in the world. So certain level of credibility. But what really struck me is, is interesting is that, okay, so last year, 16.5 million. This year, 17.1 million. Now, presumably, there will be a lot more autonomy put into vehicles between now and 2021, yet it's only $31.8 million for the total market for... But still doubling what they're well, spending Well, it's today. almost doubling. Yeah, sort of. Yeah, yeah, but doesn't it sound like a low number? Uh, no, because I think that uh, it's just a layer. You're, I mean, that's, that's a, you're layering it on top of every year. Um, I don't really think that's much of a concern. So, so you don't think that if, so if you, if you, if you like square the number of cars that have the stuff, you're seeing a lot more consolidation in the industry in terms of infotainment, um, telematics, uh, and the, a lot of the driver assist technology. Mm -hmm. So when you can apply that as a blanket, uh, you know, it, 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 you're not, uh, there shouldn't be as much uh, to spend if you can, can keep consolidating. Fair point. What do you think? It sounds like a pittance. That's exactly. Yeah, I mean, thirty million bucks. You know, uh, you know, that's not even a rounding. No, it's not that much money. But what I'm, I'm what I'm getting at is that, uh, um, you know, the, what is it? What is a good amount? I mean, what should there be more? Yeah. <laughs> Why? Well, you know, but here's the other thing. What's it going to take to make a car hardened? If it's hardware, this money is nothing. If it's a software patch. Then that's probably a lot of money. Okay, but okay, but look at it this way. So, 
So, Dave, to your point is is that okay? Once you once you've developed something and there are fewer companies doing the development, that the money goes further because it's being spent more in a fo more focused manner, yes. right? Okay. But just looking from the point of view of going from Windows 8 to Windows 10, suddenly all the work on Windows 8 isn't all that relevant for Windows 10, mm -hmm. right? So if, if you have a system now, presumably by 2020, there'll be something different, right? So you'll have to spend again. Yes, but that is, uh, I don't think it's really clear. Is that money being spent on past products, uh, you know, looking at, um, uh, you know, all of a sudden we found a fault in a car, and so say we're looking at 20, year 2020, mm -hmm. is that looking at a problem that for a car that has a uh, you know, 2014 model that's six years old, you have an issue, but or are we talking about future product development? Um, no, but to me it's, it's not a lot, because if you look at the numbers that we're, they're claiming that are being spent, is that a global number? Yeah. See, that's oh, nothing. That's, that's, See, you I know, thought you were talking about their numbers are, market. They're, oh, that'd, they're, be like the, the, I don't, that'd be like the Farmington Hills number. Look, if that was just the U.S. market, that would be about yeah. a buck a car. Yeah. That's nothing. And in, in 2021 or whatever, it'd be two bucks a car. Right. If you're talking yeah, on a that's, global that's a, basis, that's a bit of an issue. You're, you're talking like, what, 10 cents a car? Mm -hmm. Not even that. Although, okay, so, so there was news this week of, of Chrysler... Um, putting bug bounties out for people to find um, mm -hmm. bugs in their vehicles. To be able to hack in. To be able to hack in because of, uh, as we talked about on the show back in July in 2015, when they uh, found out that $1.4 million, $4 million, $1.4 million Chrysler and Dodge vehicles were susceptible to being hacked due to that uh, Wired, Wired Magazine story. But, okay, so what are they paying? From 150 to 1500 bucks for somebody to find one of these things. Right. It's not very much. It's not very much. Google pays a lot but, more for finding bugs on that. Um, not really. Not necessarily. Uh, Google, oh, oh, Google, you're saying. Yes. I'm sorry. I, I meant Tesla. Tesla also pays uh, not even that much. Tesla will pay uh, typically up to about 1000 bucks. although it depends, because Tesla opens this up and says, you can hack anything, even our corporate computers, not just our cars. And I, I think the biggest prize they paid out was to, uh, like $10,000 to some Chinese university. That was... Must have been able to, they must have had one hell of a good hack. Hmm. But, but the other thing, too, is Tesla, which is the first automaker to actually start doing this, paying a bounty for hackers to say, hey, look what I'm able to do. Uh, they created a wall of fame. It's a website, and they, they post who's been able to hack in. Uh, they haven't updated it since 2014. Hmm. So does that mean that they've solved all their problems or, or sure, what? Yeah. I, Although you gotta, you got to admit, though, that, and, and I'm sure Anton would agree, that by finding a bug or hacking into Tesla would be far more prestigious than hacking into FCA. Yes, so totally you know, there, agree. There's something to be said for, for doing that. I would agree. Mm -hmm. Well, the other thing, too, is, you know, there's this uh, automotive ISAC that's been formed. ISAC is, I think, Information Sharing and Assessment Center. And it's where all the car companies band together and say, hey, have you been hacked? Yeah, I've been hacked. Well, what are they doing? They, they did this. How'd you solve it? And so they share information. And suppliers are joining this thing, too. And uh, almost seems to me that might be... Uh, the way that this really ends up going, rather than relying on outsiders trying to hack in, is quickly identifying who is hacking in and what do we have to do to stop them. Mm -hmm. The biggest problem, though, is, you know, I think long term is how do you, when you find a vulnerability, how do you end up patching it? Because you're going to have, you know, think about how many updates you get for apps on your phone. Right. right. How are you going to? You know, that's over the air. That's, people are going to... That's you why know, the industry has to go to they over have the air. To. They have to. Because that's the only way that you can quickly uh, uh, deal with a hack coming in. And, you know, the, the hackers also share information, or some of them do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even though somebody, one hacker, a black hatter, may take a long time to make a hack... Once he makes that hack and shares that information, others, bang, 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 can take that learning and hack in far more f quickly. So this is why the, uh, the automakers have formed this ISAC. Well, it's interesting. So our friends at Lojack indicate that July is National Vehicle Theft Prevention Month. And, and so interestingly enough, that they're focusing on more cyber threats to vehicles rather than just somebody stealing your car, you know, breaking the window mm -hmm. and, and hot wearing it. Car cloning, 
Savvy thieves create and install a fake VIN number, allowing a stolen vehicle to go unnoticed. Hackers then use the stolen VINs to create false new documents. Vehicle ransom. Cyber criminals could leverage ransomware to break into a vehicle, disable the engine and brakes, and demand payment to restore the car to its operating. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, they call it bricking a car. That's the parlance. But uh, the other stuff of uh, fake VINs, that's already happening. Yeah. Now, it's not happening cybersecurity-wise. It's literally thieves... You know, driving a few cities over, you know, wandering up and down the BMW uh, lot, writing down VIN numbers, and then go out and create well, mm -hmm. fake VINs that way. Steal a car, change the VIN, and, uh, and typically ship it overseas. Scanner boxes. These are devices that can exploit a vehicle's electronic system utilized by key fobs. Criminals can then unlock, even start a vehicle without even touching the key. That just happened to FCA this week. Really? We should all just drive Model Ts. That's <laughs> well, you don't have to go back that far. You know, there are no electronics in cars. I think I'm relatively safe in saying this. There's no real electronics in cars probably pre-75. I think the first electronic controller came into a car, you know, like the Eek system at Ford and yeah. the like came in circa 75. But even then, I mean, you could probably still go, you know, I'd say up till the advent of OnStar, and you could pretty much... Uh, yeah, eat. nothing over the air yeah. coming into your car, right? Pretty much. And last but not least, this, this I thought was the most interesting one, identity theft. Thieves are targeting the data available within the car, including credit card details, location information, social security numbers, and the driver's license numbers. So, you know, it, it seems to me that, that more cars that, you know, you get into are, you know, asking you for more information that you're putting into it, or people that are doing, you know, um, buying stuff online, using their car. Um, so suddenly, you know, this is a repository of information about you that you prob probably didn't even think about. And if somebody can hack into that, it's probably easier than uh, hacking into your, your phone, which is generally on your person, or your computer, which is generally on your desk or at home somewhere. And suddenly you have all of this information out there. I think people would be stunned to learn how much data their car already is collecting on them. And, and any car probably from tw 2012 onward, I think people would be stunned to learn how much data is being collected by their car, not by their phone in their car, but by the car itself. Hmm. So, I mean, the thing about uh, you could, they could know where you are, you know, when you, your daily habits. Yeah, you, where you, you know, where you go and, uh, then, you know, they could open your garage door for you. Um, you know, there's a lot of things. It's concierge that, uh, service. That's yeah. <laughs> concierge there's staff. there's just so much out there that... Uh -huh. um, that's why I drive with an aluminum foil hat over my car. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did that to style. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Here, oh, here, here's a question we didn't get to, and I didn't ask uh, Jeff about it, because I know he's not going to talk about future product, but you're the perfect guy to ask, Dave. Oh. Mm. Doc Wolf wrote in to say, I believe the Avenir concept, remember the Buick Avenir concept, knockout, good-looking car, was built on the ready or almost ready for production Omega platform, and uh, likely would have been the first car in that platform, or, you know, uh, Cadillac might have had it with a, a CT3. Uh, he says, why not bring out the Avenir as a Park Avenue? <laughs> uh, well, I mean, let's not, I, Jeff mentioned, I mean, this segment is shrinking, these large sedans. Um, it's just, it's a dying segment. Yeah. People. I think that answers it that, right there. It, there's just there's no market there for it. Um, and uh, that's, that is really the, the crux of it. I mean, crossovers, that's where people want to go. Um, and the people that traditionally, you know, your older crowd, they want to be in a crossover. It's easier ingress and egress. So uh, it's kind of the death of the big sedan. Mm -hmm. but, but, you know, I, I thought that this actually was the Avenir concept, that that's, mm -hmm. that's where it came from. The grill. The grill, yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. about it. Yeah. But no, that's, I mean, it was, uh, no, not even close. <laughs> <laughs> Had four doors. Yeah, that was about it. And four wheels. See, now we're going to see. We're getting closer and closer. Steering wheel. <laughs> now we're getting too nitty gritty. Take that tinfoil hat off. Again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. What's also, what else is on your list there, Gary? Um, I thought this was, this was an interesting thing that I learned, uh, that taxis aren't suffering so badly in New York City because of Uber. Really? Yeah. And uh, According to who? 
According to uh, Morgan Stanley, did some research on this. And so in April of this year, there were 11.1 million taxi trips in New York City. But the price of and, a medallion um, has it's, dropped it's more, it's more than double the number of trips that people have taken in Uber. Well, the, but the price of a medallion has still come down. Yeah, well, it's not. Yeah, I'm not sure the taxi drivers would agree with that. Yeah. They're pretty upset about Uber. However, Uber is uh, growing at 121 percent in New York, and uh, they had 4.7 million rides. But they're finding that that taxis are doing more runs than Uber drivers are. But, but didn't thinking, the taxis guys create their own app? Uh, you know, uh, uh, mm -hmm. similar to an Uber app mm -hmm. too. So I mean, they they are responding. So the Uber drivers performed an average of 44 trips per week or six trips per day over a seven-day week. Taxi drivers, on the other hand, were performing 91 trips per week or 13 trips a day. Of course, chances are the Uber driver is also, you know, a barista or something. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. and it isn't uh, trying to earn his or her more own uh, nut on that. And, uh, but it was interesting, Lyft, okay, which is the General Motors bought into mm -hmm. um, ride-hailing service, it saw an 871% increase in trips, but that's only 750,000 rides in New York in April. City? Yeah. Wow. So 4.7 for, for Uber, 4.7 million for Uber, and uh, less than uh, 750,000, so less than, so it's growing, but yeah. Well, this Uber, Uber's still the, uh, the, big, the big dog. I mean, it's still, it's a, uh... It's an interesting market, though, because, I mean, it, just the cost for an Uber driver to have a car, like, in Manhattan is still out of sight, but uh, it might be cheaper to drive it than it is to park it, so. <laughs> yeah, so they're just, just endless, <laughs> endless, driving. endlessly driving. That's in, good. <laughs> the, what else happened this yeah, week? Well. I, uh, one, one thing I wanted to talk about is Ford announcing it's doing this experiment in Germany with collaborative robotics. You know, these are robots that can safely work right next to a human being. Because heretofore, you know, you guys have been in a, a, a assembly plants, and these robots are these big, massive machines that have got to be fenced off because they are so dangerous. So bringing, yeah, here, here's the robot right here. Um, I, I think this could be revolutionary in manufacturing. And... If I were in China, I'd be scared of this because I believe this is going to eliminate a lot of jobs in the plant. So what, what I find to be interesting about this is, is the fact that I think that in, in, in robot parlance, okay, the, the hand is actually called an end effector. And I think the end effector really doesn't look like that nice orange glove that's shaking the guys. You're giving them a right. fist bump and that whole thing that it basically looks like a a tool of some sort and it's more mechanical. Um, you know, one of the interesting things about, you know, the robots in, in factories over the years is that, you know, um, early on it was this thing that people would get robots in their factories just because, you know, the guy down the street had a robot so they needed a robot and then pretty much spot welding has been completely, you know, revolutionized mm -hmm. by robotics that, you know, you, no one is doing spot welding manually anymore. I mean, that, that's a thing of the past. But what was interesting is is that and, and you know this very well, John, that when you'd go to the big three plants, they generally had the big giant robots. And the Japanese plants generally had smaller robots that were positioned more tactically through the line where they could do other things. And I think that this, this collaborative robotic thing is, is just a real trend there whereby you have you know, smaller robots. And in this case, as you say, they have sensing so that if they touch they'll even stop. lightly right yeah. they'll stop and they, and they won't cause a uh, cause a problem and uh, not take um, your head off not take your head off and you know um, to the extent so, so so the big thing though is is to think about this is that robot programming can can be the real challenge because you know we can program ourselves fairly easily and we can do tasks but if we have a whole bunch of these smaller things that actually can work Collaborative, collaboratively with a worker, you sure as hell make sure that that robot is doing what that robot needs to be doing. So if it's torquing something or lifting something or, you know, doing a certain task that it can only do those tasks and not like whip around and, and decide to do something else because... Uh, Although I've seen a demonstration with these collaborative robots, they're super easy to program. You've got this little keypad, you know, touch pad thing, 
you hit record, you grab that robot arm, and you move it to, you know, pick up the part, and then you move it to where it has to install it. You hit save, and it's programmed. Hmm. I mean, you don't sit there, you know, coding stuff in. The only thing, you know, you're talking about China, like, oh, if I were in China, I'd be, well, I'm, the thing I look at it is, is this is great, it would be great here, because this is, in, in high cost countries, Germany right. here, right. it's going to no, be able th- to help why preserve. I'm China, Dave, because I know of a, a company out in Brighton, Michigan, that makes axle shafts, not for cars. They do it for ATVs and other, mm-hmm. you know, personal craft kind of stuff. They installed one of these uh, collaborative robots, installed, programmed, ready to go, forty five thousand dollars, paid for itself in less than a year. Worked so well, their their axle shaft production went up so dramatically, they shut down their plant in China, Mm. resourced everything to the United States. And that's where I think China and Mexico and other low-cost countries are going to go, whoa, because, yeah, even a Chinese worker today is cheaper than $45,000, but that's year one. By year two, it's already cheaper to have the robot here. Yeah, and if you go to, like, um, you know, Wolfsburg and see, you know, they, how they've been able to, you know, keep producing vehicles in Germany, you know, especially like a low cut, like a Golf, and you know, you see it, and you're like, okay, they, there's a lot more automation that they brought in just so they can keep manufacturing relevant in these high cost mm-hmm. countries, and that's I mean, that's how we're going to keep things here. It may not be as many humans as it used to be, but we'll still yeah. be manufacturing things here in the no, long term. Of course, of course right. the problem will be if the Chinese start making those robots, then uh, <laughs> we'll have to buy them from them, and you know, it'll be uh, the... Uh, um... Oh, we've got to take another quick break right now. <laughs> they, they just brought a sign into the studio here. To, yes, and we're going to do that. We're going to give a good shout out to our friends at Lear. Lear Connexus offers a parental controls application with geofencing that sends notifications regarding driving behavior and location, including curfew alerts, acceleration alerts, and speed alerts, all delivered to a smartphone application that includes vehicle location, driver notifications, and a report card of driving history, including notifications when predefined geographic boundaries are crossed. For more information, visit Lear.com. So, so John, last you know, late, late, last week we were off for the Independence Day holiday. Right. Yet I turned on television, and lo and behold, there you were on TV. I saw you on Channel Four talking about the oh, uh, yeah they that the, right. they, the, came out. they they came and asked you about the uh, the collision um, with the autopilot system, the yeah, uh, the Tesla system, the Tesla system. Yeah. Well, you know, this is an amazing accident. And I, Which I think, one are you talking about? I'm talking about the one in Florida, okay, yeah. where this Tesla is driving down the highway, and the driver is watching a Harry Potter movie on a DVD player. Allegedly. Allegedly. And neither he nor his Tesla autopilot system recognizes that a, a semi-truck has pulled across the road and is blocking it entirely, and his car doesn't even tap the brakes. Goes right into this thing, instantly killing the guy. And... Uh, so, there, yeah, there's a lot to talk about on this. And, uh, boy, where do we start? I, I think, A, number one, this is going to be a very painful lesson for Tesla, that you do not do beta testing with your with owners public, yeah. when it comes to safety systems. If you want to beta test, you know, the radio or whatever, that's different. Okay, but how is, how is this beta testing when it says explicitly that you should be aware and have your hands on the wheel when autopilot is engaged. No, I'll, I'll tell you because exactly it's not fa- it's not fail. You know, it still can fail. That's what they're so Mercedes no, and no, Volvo. But they're, but they're admitting that. Yeah, but that's yeah. not enough, Gary. When, when your CEO comes out later and says, "Hey, guess what? You can drive from San Francisco to Seattle and you don't have to do a thing," then you go, "You've just forgotten all these warnings that the company put out." And when you look at the way that Mercedes and Volvo have handled it. If you don't have your hands on the wheel, the, you know, a big icon right. comes up on the instrument panel yeah, showing you better grab the wheel. And if you don't do that, it disables the system. The car starts to slow down. Then you got to grab the wheel. So that's why I'm saying it is different. I, I think t- Tesla is going to get nailed. Uh, uh, whoever the family or estate is, yeah. they got and one big whopping two, uh, two more that we know of um, since then, one in Montana, Pennsylvania. Well, hold on. We don't no. know if there are... 
autopilot related? No, but. in fact, Tesla's come out on the Pennsylvania one and said, nah, our yeah. data shows the autopilot was not engaged. I don't know about the other one. Yeah, the one in Montana. So I think, you know, anybody who gets in trouble is going to blame te uh, Tesla owners. They're going to go, oh, it was the autopilots. You know, this is like unintended acceleration. It's, uh, it's not that. But they have a hell of a problem when their system can't tell that a semi is blocking the road. All right, so so I, I was doing a little investigating and I found a geek blog. So I, this guy who is a uh, um, EFF director, Singularity University facility, software architect, uh, internet entrepreneur, robotic car strategist, futurist lecturer, hobby photographer, okay. and Burning Man artist, <laughs> Brad Templeton. <laughs> <laughs> and and he, the Burning Man thing. And, and, and so so he I mean he broke this whole thing down and he basically said okay Mobileye who is used by Tesla it's their technology so it's not like Elon Musk made this in his basement okay, he bought this commercial technology issued a statement reminding people that their system is not designed to do well on cross traffic at present but their 2018 product will okay so from the get go here's Mobileye say wait 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 it was never intended for cross cross traffic. It is also worth noting that the camera they use sees only red and gray intensity and does not see all the colors, making it have an even harder time with the white truck and bright sky. I know, but we've all... Okay, invisible! Yeah, but listen, we all drive cars with adaptive cruise control. I'll bet the adaptive cruise would have caught that. We also have... Okay, adaptive cruise control is based on what? Radar. 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 Right. Well, okay. this has got radar. Yeah, the Tesla no, system has it's, radar. It's a vision it's a system. No, no, no. no it's, it's, a it's both of different things. It's it's both. Because he doesn't use LIDAR. No, no, it does not use LIDAR. But it does have a, a, a radar system, and I, I, I just learned it's a long-range radar. And long-range radar also has to look for, let's say you're coming, cresting over a hill or coming up to the crest of a hill, and right behind it is a big overhead freeway sign. The system's got to recognize, oh, yeah, it's a free, a freeway I, I can ignore sign, that. Not a, uh, so, yeah. but, the, the point that was made to me is it doesn't have a short range radar that would have said, whoa, you know, this doesn't look like no freeway sign to me. I better select. And the other thing is both systems, both the camera and the radar, both have to agree. Yes, there is something there. And if one doesn't agree, the system doesn't react to it at all. Does it blow your mind that people are paying money for to beta test software for, for Tesla, submit data, so in theory, they could they could make the system better. Not I mean, the, didn't that, you didn't you drive over here on Waze? <laughs> no, but I'm. But, but I'm, what are you doing with the? What, I, what is, I don't have. I didn't give control to Waze. No, but you gave your data to. That's fine. I, I know, but what I'm getting at is, I didn't pay for Waze. I'm saying that people are paying thousands of dollars. No, to, they bought the car, and with the car, they're no. Oh, this is the, so they're paying. They're paying Elon for this money for this software. Yes, to no, turn no, this no, on. But, okay, they're paying for the software. They're not. They're not paying in order to give them information. No, but in turn, because it's they're giving data and to It's Tesla. the same thing that we have with these things. I, not, I do not, that's not the point I'm getting at. I'm getting at, if you beta test Windows 10 before it came out, they gave it to you for free. Mm -hmm. um, Tesla should have just, if you're gonna do this, you know, have it uh, like a, with a lot of um, training wheels on it, basically, you know, that says, hey, you know, you're gonna have to put your hand down at every 10, 15 seconds or something, and we'll let you do it for free. And then when we nail it, when we get it, then we'll we'll turn it off over the air, and then you will but you when can did, buy it. When did they ever say you can drive without your hands on the wheel? What? When did they say that? All the time. No, they didn't. I don't know about Seattle to San yeah. Francisco. No, but he said you don't have to do a thing. That's what the Elon came no, but out. There, no, but there, if, if we looked, if we had the exact phrasing, there is a little wiggle room in he there. He said, basically, you don't have to do a thing. Well, how many Tesla owners think that? Go on YouTube. And when all these YouTube videos came out of people doing crazy things. Yeah, climbing in they, the back seat. Oh, yeah, that's what you're supposed to be able to do. They should have come down with a ton yeah. of bricks and said, we don't support this. You should not but be doing it. But the problem is, it's beta software. People paid for it. So now, if they dial back on the capability of it, you know, hey, you got to put your hand on the steering wheel. Do they have to refund people money because it's, the, it's not what they paid for? I mean, this opens up a whole can of worms of Well, my prediction things. is Tesla is not going to do beta testing with safety-related products. Other stuff, sure, go right ahead, yeah. but not when it comes to safety. And I, I think they're going to pay a big price for this in court. What's Gary doesn't I, think I, I'm, 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 I'm just, I'm... I, I, I think driver responsibility is something that cannot be 
understated under any circumstances. I and and don't clearly, agree with you. I think I think that if you have a motive, I, I read this. This was a story in the Washington Post this morning, which I just thought was just striking. This is the opening behind the wheel of a turbocharged BMW. The 20 year old shot down River Road in Bethesda at 115 miles per hour, 70 over the posted limit. He was heading home after picking up Chinese food for his family. Ahead on the other side of a slight rise, a Chevrolet Volt carrying a family of four was about to make a left turn from the opposing lanes. They're on their way to a high school play and we're five minutes from curtain time. The crash was thunderous, okay? So here's a car that is going 70 miles an hour faster than it ought to be going. Who's responsible, BMW or the driver? Driver, driver. Exactly, the driver, the driver is yeah. responsible. So right. when you and I are, we get in any car, it's up to us. It doesn't matter what the technology it is. It doesn't what it allows us to do it. We have to be responsible. Tell that to the jury when the crime yeah. family is there Not saying the system couldn't tell that there was a semi across okay, so, the road. So why should, why should BMW be able to make a car that goes 115 miles an hour? Because there's times when you got to punch it and get out of the way of that semi truck that's you can barreling take it on the down track. on you. Does it say somewhere to only drive at 115 on a track? That's the law. No, I understand that, but it's a responsibility that, I mean. I, I agree with you, but people are abusing what this is, I, this system. People are. And, and it's people's fault. And they shouldn't be beta test. Humans should not be beta testing hey, things that can put other people's lives in danger. So, so do it in a closed environment. Okay, we're, we're throwing the term beta testing around here a lot. Did, because is, that's what this is. Okay, so, so, so define for me, please, what the beta testing consists of. That's what they're calling it. Who's calling it? A Tesla. So Tesla said that we're beta testing. Yes, this is beta software, yes. Okay. Yeah, that's how they tried to get off the hook. But like I said, I, I, I think this will put an end to that practice. I hope so. It scares hey. me. Okay, enough Tesla. We got a number of questions here. We ought to wrap up the show in a rapid fire uh, uh, way. Uh, so I'm gonna throw this out here. Uh, AA guest 032 says, do you think Saab will come to the US soon? No. That's the right answer. <laughs> Gary, you got anything to weigh in on that? Saab? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, they're not coming to the U.S. soon. They're not coming anywhere soon. Okay, Tom wants to know, did any auto companies in char install charging stations free in the USA? Yes. The company we were just talking about. And yeah, Nissan is doing Oh, Nissan. Yeah, they've just been doing some too. Doing yes. That. That's right. Yeah. Well, they they started turning them on free in particular oh, markets. Oh, good good point. Well, they, so, they did two things. They uh also they footed the bill for a bunch of um level 3 chargers and they also are allowing charging through third-party systems for free in many big cities. Right. Right, but it's not it's not 100% across the board. No. No, but Tesla is the only one really that's built a kind of a coast to coast a network, network yeah. That Level right. or you know S and X buyers can use for free, and soon Volkswagen will for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> that that might be true. Okay, Paul uh, Wickland wants to know. Well, uh, so will Ford get rid of that V10 motor and install the new turbo V6 and 10-speed transmission in motor homes? I don't think they will. Why? Uh, well, motor homes that you'd be in boost all the time and you don't have to submit any fuel economy information on a motorhome, so it's not really a... But you'd be an EcoBoost. And they still do that, that V10 in like the class six trucks too, so like uh, I actually had the uh, F650 dump truck. Um, Home for a test drive? Oh yeah, for a week. No, you're yeah. kidding, you're yeah, serious. Big bright orange F650 get... dump truck, I... crew cab. Man, the V10. I, so uh, I got about four miles to the gallon. It was he was, he, he was an Uber contractor. He was. Uh... <laughs> okay, Ron Paris wants to know. So Nissan has a new version version of the Navara pickup already available in other markets, including the EU, and we're still waiting for a new frontier in the U.S. What's with that? That's a good question. Mm. Got a lot of Titans they need to sell. Why would you? Uh, when they're going to sell what eighty thousand Frontiers this year? Why would you bring a new, more expensive truck here? I mean, that's, uh, they're selling plenty of them. It, it'll come. It's an old truck, though. It's, it's an old cheaper. truck, but there's, mm. people are still buying it. They are. So all the costs are all taken out of it. Uh, chuck Grenchy 
touching on a topic we uh, talked about earlier. He says $1,500 from FCA for a more egregious breach. Are you kidding me? If you want serious hackers to look at your software, uh, and I'm uh, paraphrasing here, go ahead and keep a $100 starting point. But for a total hack, even $100,000 would be cheap. He's right. He is right. He's right. Because the, unless your name is on the wall at Tesla, then that would be even more valuable. I, to I, I totally agree with him. That's that, that they're paying pennies. Okay, Robert says, I've noticed that seats and cars are getting less compliant, stiffer. I remember when you could get into a luxury car and be cosseted by soft, supportive seats. No longer the case. Today, they're so firm and stiff and unyielding. Can we at least have an opulent seat option? He's right. Seats are far stiffer today. Now, what the ergonomic engineers will say, yeah, go get in that soft, plush, crushed velour, Corinthian leather seat of your and drive across the country and see what your back's telling you about how comfortable it is versus a seat that gives you more support. However, having said that, I'm with him. I would like more comfy seats in luxury cars and maybe not just luxury either. I, you know, a lot of that has to do with, uh, you know, we're seeing seats get thinner. Um, there's less, you know, a lot of materials being taken out and uh, they need to last longer. You know, we don't want them to look like they're sagging after uh, five years. So, you know, there's a lot of reasons why, but um, I think a lot of it has to do with the support. Um, not that I'm a big fan, but those zero gravity seats in the Nissan cars are pretty painful, actually. Mm. Not, you know, short term you get in, you're like, this is not comfortable, but I think long term, when you sit in it for a long time, you get used to it and it, and it feels more comfortable, you know, driving up to the grocery store. It's not, doesn't feel very good. So that's basically like if you hit yourself with a hammer, you pretty much get used to it. And then it would be like sleeping in like a bed at motel six. Not you know? comfortable. I know this for a fact. Robert also goes on to say newer cars have less knee room, especially for the driver's right knee. He says, why is this? Is it done for crash? crash performance, why not have more room to spread your knees when you're just cruising along? I, I mean, I notice a lot of it. I actually sit you're a pretty, tall guy. I so. sit pretty close, and I'm noticing a lot of things intruding on my knee these days. Isn't that just because the center console yeah, they is keep there? Getting, like, and, and so like they're getting so wider. If, so if we go back in the day when you had these very plush seats, and they were nice bench seats, and you yeah. spread out, yeah. and you had your stuff there, that you also had the shifter yeah, column was on the mount. column, right? Yeah. And therefore, you didn't have any center console. So you could just basically, you know, get the wide, wide stance there when you're driving. That's, I, I wonder, too, this, this would have been a good question for Jeff when he was here earlier about this very thing. You know, now a lot of cars have knee airbags and knee bolsters. And I know in some cars you get in and the dead pedal on the left-hand side is in a kind of awkward position. That's done for safety reasons, mm -hmm. to get your your foot up a little bit away, especially in those small overlap crashes. You know, it can absolutely break your foot. So we give up all this comfort just so they can crash these things well. I wonder if that's true, that they want your knees pointed right at that bolster or knee bag. It's possible. I, uh, I'm not really sure, but, I, and that's, and it's still a kind of a technology that's in, in its uh, infancy as well. But yeah, I, I mean, I, I always think about that because I actually sit really close and, uh, and I'm always thinking about my knees. I'm, I'm gonna lose my knees and if I get in an accident, but uh, yeah, that, that's the other, you know, the things hitting my knee or rubbing on sharp the plastic. time that happens, the beta testing will be over. You'll just get a Tesla, you just, you'll just drive from San Francisco to Seattle to and you won't, even, you won't even touch it. <laughs> Real good, well, we gotta wrap it up here. Dave, thanks so much for stopping by. Thanks for having me. We'll have you back again, this has been good. Gary, let's do it again next week. Okay, take care. Good deal. I want to thank all of you for having tuned in. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone Tires, your journey, our passion. Lear, a global leader in automotive seating and electrical systems. And by Borg Warner, feel good about driving. Visit our website, autoline.tv, where you can watch us live Thursday afternoons. Get your daily fix with AutoLine Daily and in-depth analysis and interviews with AutoLine This Week. There's all that and much more at AutoLine.tv.